Well, welcome everyone to our webinar on service monitoring secrets of success with Device Pilot and Winnow. Thank you for joining us at this challenging time. I hope you and your loved ones are safe and well. Our purpose today is to share best practice around service monitoring for companies using IoT. To introduce myself, I'm Pilgrim Beer, CEO of Device Pilot, which is a service monitoring tool. Previously, I started a company called AlertMe, which created the UK's first mass market smart home platform. Between 2006 and 2015, AlertMe grew from an idea to the point where we deployed millions of connected devices into homes across the UK and USA. We were then acquired by Centrica, British Gas, as the foundation of their Hive smart home heating offering. Looking back at that journey, when we started AlertMe, we didn't realize that we'd need service monitoring, which made the middle part of our journey much more painful, slow and expensive than it needed to be. And the realization that all companies that use IoT will need service monitoring was our inspiration for starting Device Pilot five years ago. So this webinar today should be about 20 minutes long. First, I'm going to introduce a bit about what service monitoring is. Then we're lucky enough to be joined by Magnus Holtberg, product manager at Winnow, a very innovative and successful company, to hear some of his experiences of service monitoring. Hello, Magnus, are you with us? I'm here, thank you for it's, having me. It's great to have you here, thank you. And finally, we'll have time for Magnus and I to answer some of your questions. If you're having any technical problems, then do use the chat window at the bottom of your Zoom window. Uh, and you can ask a question at any time by clicking the Q&A button uh, and we'll try and answer those questions at the end. So I think the key point to start with is that these days IoT devices are increasingly deployed to deliver a service to the customer, some ongoing benefit. The customer isn't paying for the device, they're paying for the service that it delivers, usually with some recurring revenue, which is at risk if you fail to provide a good service. So service monitoring is the tool or set of tools which enables you to deliver that good service. At a high level, there are really three critical business reasons to use service monitoring. The first is protecting revenue, that your customers will only go on paying you if you go on delivering a great service. The second is that service monitoring allows you to dramatically increase your operational efficiency, deliver a better service while actually reducing your costs. Because arming your employees with a powerful tool makes them more productive, because understanding which of your problems happens 50% of the time and which happens only 1% of the time, then lets you spend your precious time in areas which will deliver the biggest return. And because buying in an off the shelf solution for service monitoring lets you spend all your precious developer time on building your domain specific application. And the third is that service monitoring helps to rescue your team from firefighting so that they can start to invest their time into activities for the next phase of growth. So it unlocks growth. Because IoT is still quite a new market, there isn't yet universal agreement on what to call the various components of an IoT solution and service monitoring is no exception. All these terms on the left and more are alternative descriptions for service monitoring. So you might hear it called service assurance or network assurance or operational management or ops or condition-based monitoring or customer experience. There are lots of different terms, but they basically all mean the same thing. That's what we're talking about today. And all those terms on the right and more are used to refer to what service monitoring does, the pieces of functionality that it provides. So for example, it's about collecting streams of telemetry from individual devices, turning them into metrics, and from those deriving key performance indicators for your device estate as a whole, such as device uptime and site availability. Then you can see if you're hitting your service level agreement with your customer. And if not, you can do root cause analysis to understand why. And functionally, it involves a rules engine which can trigger when certain conditions are met, perhaps anomalies, and then drive business processes such as alerting people or automating actions in other business tools all with the goal of ensuring and improving the delivery of the service, the benefit that your connected device is supposed to be providing to your customer. So just to give a very brief outline of where service monitoring fits into your overall architecture. Your IoT devices will be streaming data into some cloud endpoint and from there into your application. Since all this is what delivers your unique value, you may need to build it yourself, including writing some code. 
Successful companies tend to focus as much as possible on these parts because they're what delivers the unique proposition to their customers. Alongside this, to run your business, you'll buy several different tools. Ticketing to manage problems, CRM to manage customers, perhaps billing systems, perhaps some kind of general analytics capability such as a BI tool. And, and these days, all of these are likely to be delivered as, as SaaS tools. So how do these two parts of your business interact? How do all the business tools interact with your IoT devices and application? On the face of it, they don't because they don't really understand IoT devices and they can't cope with the kind of streaming telemetry that comes from them. Service monitoring is what joins these two parts of your business together. Service monitoring takes the same streaming data that comes from your devices and uses it to help you manage your devices and your service quality by interacting with your business tools. Service monitoring usually has some kind of user interface of its own, but it also interfaces with the other SaaS IT tools that you already use to run your business. So for example, if a device goes offline, then the service monitoring tool can raise a ticket in your ticketing system to get a human to fix the problem. And when it sees that the problem is fixed, it can automatically close the ticket. So it's not just spraying out notifications that will get ignored, it's driving your business processes and keeping your various business tools synchronized and actively managing your service quality. Of course, this doesn't happen completely autonomously. Humans are using service monitoring to identify and characterize new kinds of fault and then building metrics and rules into the service monitoring tool to automate their detection and resolution in the future. So when does a company need service monitoring? Well, at the start of the IoT journey, they don't. They'll be doing R&D. They'll be designing and building their device, or at least specifying and sourcing it. They'll be choosing and setting up their communications and probably building a customer facing application too. And once it's all feature complete, they'll try it out with maybe 10 friendly employees to start to shake out all the bugs. And then they'll probably build 100 devices and ship them to early beta testers to get some more miles on the clock before starting to release to paying customers. And the way that they'll be supporting these devices during these early days will be with human beings. And at this stage, that's exactly right, because human beings are really great at dealing with all the random things that can go wrong. We're, we're flexible, we're creative, we're resourceful. And eventually they'll get enough confidence to launch. That might be a soft launch or a big bang, but either way, from then on out, it's all about growth. A thousand devices, 10,000 devices and so on. And that's when they'll discover that they absolutely do need service monitoring. Perhaps the thing which really distinguishes IoT from everything else is that IoT devices are deployed into the real world, which is a messy and uncontrolled environment where everything that can go wrong will go wrong. And they might even invent some new ways to make things go wrong. And all of this will threaten their ability to deliver a good service to their customers and to keep on growing. An exponentially growing number of devices in the field needs an exponentially growing amount of management and operations to look after them. And if they try to use humans to do all that, then their costs will grow exponentially too. If supporting a thousand devices took five people, then supporting 10,000 devices will take 50 people. And even if they could afford all those people, they still won't do a good job because service monitoring needs to be done rapidly. It needs to be done reliably and it can get pretty repetitive. And humans just aren't good at rapid, reliable, and repetitive. But machines are, which is why at this point, they need a software tool to, to take the strain. And that software tool is service monitoring. So from that moment on, every company is in effect asking itself the same big question every day. Is our device estate ready to deliver our business today? The question never goes away. In fact, it just gets bigger and bigger because it's right at the core of what they are as a business. And if they don't know the answer, one can be very sure it's a no, which will ultimately be fatal. In these times of, of crisis that we're in at the moment, it's even more important to keep on top of things and react quickly, especially if you're delivering systems that could save lives. And particularly if you're expecting that perhaps there'll be some people off ill over the next few weeks, then it's really important um, that anyone and everyone in the business is able to get at the information they need to carry on uh, making the business functional rather than relying on some gate gatekeeper who's manually collecting the data and building reports. So 
who who owns service monitoring? Who who specifies it? Who uses it? Well, what we see in our customers and prospects is that it's primarily the people who are responsible for end user experience. And they might have a title like operations manager or customer experience, or in a digital first company, it's quite likely they'll have a title like product manager, as that role can have responsibility for the entire customer experience from design to delivery. Often they're hired or promoted into a new role, especially created when the company suddenly realizes that having shoved all this stuff out into the world, it might be a good idea to start to pay attention to whether it's actually delivering value. They may come from a technical background, though often not, but they're generally not a software developer as their day job, they're a business person. And as for the other people who use service monitoring every day, either directly or via the SaaS tools that it's integrated with, they're typically customer facing roles, such as customer service, who use it to become aware of uh, problems, to diagnose and, and resolve them. But service monitoring can be used by anyone who needs to know what's going on with the com company's service delivery out there in the real world. So for example, a salesperson who's about to visit a customer can check how the rollout's going and be forewarned of any teething problems or a CFO can check that the number of active devices in the last month matches what they've billed the customer for, or a CEO can show their investors lovely graphs of growing numbers of devices and steadily improving quality and ever-growing service value being delivered. So now I'd like to introduce Magnus Holtberg, product manager at Winnow. Thank you so much for joining us, Magnus. Glad to be here. So perhaps you would like to start just by introducing Winnow and your role in the company, and in particular, what, what's made you such a successful company? Absolutely. Um, yeah, let's start with a bit of background to, to Winnow itself. So we help professional kitchens uh, reduce their, the food waste in their production process. And we do that by uh, putting scales under their bins. We tell them to dedicate a bin to food waste we have a scale under the bin and every time somebody throws a piece of food away we track the weight of that item of course with the scale and then we ask the person to input on an android tablet why did you just throw something away what was the reason for discarding this and what was the item you threw away and we collect all that data uh, we we pull that up to our, uh, uh, our cloud and then we crunch reports every day and we send that back to the people in the kitchen so every day they get a report of what actually was, was thrown into their bin yesterday. And we organize that by value and not by weight, because in our system, we know the cost of their ingredients and the various items they throw in the bin. So they can focus their waste reduction uh, uh, efforts on the areas of waste in their kitchen or the parts of the process in their kitchen that generates the highest cost of waste. And by doing that consistently, by having visibility on this information and doing these changes, little changes every day throughout a number of weeks, over the course of the first year, typically we see food waste being cut in half, which means that they cut their food costs by about two to 8%. And we on average save uh, kitchens we work with about 20,000 US dollars per year. And, and that's a big deal in a restaurant kitchen with small profit margins and, uh, and, and not that many costs that they can actually really manage as directly as they can, as, as they can with their food purchasing. And I'm a, I'm a product manager at Winnow. I've been with Winnow for uh, just over four years now. We're a team of five product managers who own uh, various aspects of what we deliver to, to our customers from, from the actual devices in the kitchens, which is all our distributed uh, remote uh, little things as we put in we put in the real in the real world as you put pilgrim with all the challenges that come with that all the way over to our reporting system personally i own the uh, the part in our system uh, that is called winnow vision where we use artificial intelligence to uh, uh, to automate the process of actually categorizing the waste gets us, that gets thrown in the bin so rather than asking a person to to tell us what they just threw away we have a camera over the bin that takes a picture and based on that picture, we categorize the, uh, the food waste based on the AI knowing what that is. Um, why we have been uh, successful, we, we've, we've certainly been successful. We've grown really rapidly over the six years or so that Winnow has operated from the, the first few attempts six years ago of trying to understand how to, to do this well and up to today where we're in 
I think more than 30 countries working with thousands of chefs uh, across the world. I think the, uh, uh, the main reason for why we've been so successful is because we focused uh, very laser-like on, on, on this one thing and really trying to understand the process in the kitchens where we can fit in with a, as little intrusion on the kitchen staff's day-to-day -day lives as possible. And by doing that, we are providing visibility on, on this, this really obscure area of information that, that people in the kitchens typically don't really see. They don't necessarily see how much they waste because it's not the same people who are ordering the food that is then cooking the food, who is serving the food and who might be bringing uneaten food back from buffets and so on. So there's a huge dark area of information here that, that people in kitchens generally find difficult to track. And we've really focused on that. And, um, and we've done that successfully in a way where uh, with a constant focus on, of course, as we like to think of it, we're, we're saving the world one kitchen at the time uh, because if food waste was a country, it would be the third biggest contributor on the planet to climate change. It's a huge problem. Um, and we're doing it in such a way that we contribute to the bottom line of our customers. So by doing the right thing for the world, they are actually also saving themselves significant amounts of money. And we really uh, managed to, uh, to build the system in such a way that we can show those, those proof points. Is that, a, is that a fair summary? Yeah, it's, it's fascinating to hear such passion uh, and innovation happening to something that affects us all, but perhaps we don't think about very much. Uh, really, really fascinating. So given that we're speaking together um, remotely from our own homes at a time of, of some crisis for everybody, I must just ask you, how are you guys? Are you all, are you all hanging in there? Are you all safe? Um, you know, business must be pretty, pretty rough uh, for your customers right now, I'd, I'd imagine. So, um, you know are things okay with you yeah we're we're okay um i'm i'm happy to say that so far i only know one of my colleagues who've actually had uh had the coronavirus um uh, and uh given that we're now about 110 120 people that's 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 good and he came through it really well uh so everything has been fine we right. uh we see a really big impact so all of our customers are of course active in the hospitality industry uh, in various forms. We work with catering businesses, we work with IKEA worldwide, we work with cruise ships, we work with hotels and casinos, like anywhere where you have large scale food production uh, in, a, in a restaurant kind of environment. We, we have customers in all those segments. And they've been, uh, as you can imagine, seriously impacted after the, the various country lockdowns and the travel restrictions. So we've taken a number of, of efforts actually to uh, to try to weather through this. Uh, we're uh, we're fur we're taking um, advantage of the furlough scheme uh, from the UK government, which uh, which helps us a lot. We're furloughing uh, a lot of the staff who normally have direct customer contact or are in sales, because we've seen a massive downturn in in the willingness to invest in systems to track waste right now for obvious reasons. Um, and we're also going down to a four day work week for the people who we are not furloughing. Uh, so all the people doing product development or tech related tasks will still be working, uh, but we'll be doing that at a slightly reduced, uh, reduced work week. And we, 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 will, we think that will get us through this in a, in a nice way uh, to weather through this, this downturn until business starts coming back. Great. Yes. Well, I think we're all looking forward to this being over, um, yeah. but it's, fan it's fantastic insight into how you're, you're dealing with it. And uh, I must say, from talking to various other customers, I think this is quite a, a common story of, of what people are doing yeah. and perhaps trying to find time to, in, in this, uh, you know, this downtime, as it were, to, to put our houses in order, as it were, and to get ready for the next phase of growth that will happen once... Uh, once things get back to yeah, uh, that's right. Well, I won't say back to normal because I think things will, may never quite be the same again. But I think clearly uh, a lot of businesses will uh, uh, burst into life again pretty rapidly once this is over. So uh, looking yeah. forward to that very much. Well, thank you again for taking the time to talk to us today. So, what does what does service monitoring mean to you as as a product manager? You know, what's the point of it? Um, yes, yeah, so to me, I, I to me it's an essential tool. We do a lot of tracking and monitoring of various things across, across our, our system, across our product, from, um, from basic 
monitoring of, of services running in AWS all the way over to behavioral tracking of customers using our products. So, the, but the service monitoring specifically focused on the devices in the field, it really helps us understand what's going on uh, and, and where and in what configuration uh, situations do we have certain types of issues coming up? Are those issues recurring? How big are those issues? Are they impacting in many places in the world, uh, all across our segments or only in specific segments? It gives us a lot of data, uh, thanks to the way we have, we have set this up, that, that helps us use it as, from a product perspective as pro prioritization signals. So we mix that in with a lot of other information to help us understand what are the areas of our product that we need to improve and, uh, and, and where do we put those efforts to make the biggest bang for the buck? And then when we have made those improvements or fixed some underlying problem and we put that back out in the real world, we can again look at that data and see, did we actually achieve what we wanted? Did we manage to remove that problem or improve that situation? Because of course the data will tell us exactly how that has changed after we made some kind of change we put out in the field. So, so that's, that's really what it is. It, it, it helps us with our prioritization, understand where we put our engineering efforts, uh, and it helps us understand if we have actually managed to solve situations that we do have in the field. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And, and I think, I mean, you've touched on quite a lot of this then, but just in terms of, I mean, you, you were talking about service monitoring as a process there, also a little bit perhaps about the tool, but just in terms of, of using a service monitoring tool, have you got any, any thoughts about that in particular? Yeah, um, so we, so we, we're obviously uh, device pilot users. Uh, we, uh, we came from a background uh, when I started, like, as I mentioned four years ago, we were kind of building everything ourselves. Small company, uh, only had a couple of hundred customers. Uh, and we, uh, we, we came from a background of basically needing to build a lot of the stuff we did ourselves, um, breaking ground into a, a world of doing business that nobody had really done before. Tracking food waste in the way that we did at the time was quite new. And I think that, that feeling of newness filtered through to a lot of the stuff we did. And there was a very much a mentality of, of building it ourselves. And one of those things that we built uh, was of course, monitoring the devices that we put out in the field just to see how things were working. So we, we literally built everything from provisioning the software onto Android devices, from configuring them, like our, our deployment tools and all these things and, and monitoring and, and tracking devices in the field was one of those. Um, and uh, as, as things grew, we realized that that was really an area that, that took a lot of time. It's a difficult thing to build and get right. And we, we kind of wanted to get away from that. So we looked around and looked at different options and we ended up uh, with device pilot to replace our own homegrown device monitoring. And we, did that for a very simple reason, in my opinion. We, we decided that collecting and, and, and storing and managing all that data that you need to actually make sure that you get real-time useful intelligence out of it is a really big challenge. And we decided that that challenge was not actually what brought us any value. We wanted to see the data, we wanted to query the data, use it for various purposes, but just completely get away from the, the headaches of, of managing all of that infrastructure. And uh, knowing that we could join device pilot and, and put those efforts onto a team that was actually uniquely put together with the skills to do that just took a lot of headache out of, out of our uh, engineering streams. And we could just reap the benefits of that data instead of just trying to create the data, so to speak. Great. Uh, just a reminder to those of you who are watching that you can ask a question at, at, at any point uh, for me or, or for Magnus and we'll answer those at the end. So uh, Magnus, um, you've talked about a, a journey um, uh, which is very interesting. Any unexpected lessons or, or surprises that you can share with people who are, who are following in your footsteps? Yeah, um, absolutely. There's, 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 there's two of them that, that spring to mind uh, quite immediately. The, 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 so the first thing that surprised me a bit was that um, it's really difficult to know what it is you want out of service monitoring. Let me, let me expand on that a bit. Analyzing time series data can be really hard. It, it takes a bit of head scratching to work out how you actually leverage the data that you have collected to answer the questions that you might have in a good way. Are you even collecting the right data? Like taking a step back sometimes and going, well, actually, 
if we want to understand this situation out in the field, if this ever occurs, we need to make sure we collect the data in such a way that we can actually see that. So that was the thing that, um, that surprised me a bit at first, but, but maybe I should have seen that coming. It's actually difficult to really understand how to make the most of this kind of, of time series based data that you get from a monitoring tool. So we had, a, we had a bunch of group discussions about that involving the support guys, trying to really understand what questions are you typically asking that you haven't been able to ask in the past with our homegrown tool and how do we then need to make sure that, that we, can, we can provide those answers. So that was probably the first area um, uh, that was a lesson to, to take mm -hmm. into account. And this, the second one was, was genuinely more of a surprise. So we, we, from a product perspective, thought of service monitoring or, or device monitoring as something that we were interested in from an engineering and, and support perspective, to be able to just react to issues in the field, quantify issues in the field and so on. But once we actually had um, uh, the device pilot tool in place, the, uh, the fact that data was, was so accessible, we could give other users easy access to it. They could build their own dashboards and actually query this data in a, in a web UI in a way that is not uh, overly complicated. We realized that there was actually a lot of pent up demand for this kind of, of information, for this kind of data, not just from support people, but from operations people and even from salespeople, uh, understanding that maybe I should go in and, and have a look at what's going on with my customer before I have that call that I'm going to have with them. So if they raise something, I know what's going on. I might even be able to see how big of an issue that is. Or after calls, uh, my customer said, this is going on uh, and I can go in myself and see where is that happening and start a conversation with the uh, support and engineering teams about trying to understand how big is this issue? What, what's a good way of approaching dealing with this? What's, what's a good answer I can get back to with my customer? Mm -hmm. So there was actually more people getting involved with this information once we had this up and running than, than, than I expected. And that, mm -hmm. that's a, that was a really positive surprise. Okay, great. So, so you've painted a picture of service monitoring as a, as a tool to turn data into insights for various people. I mean, can you give us a, an example or two of that in, in practice? You know, maybe sort of troubleshooting or targeting or prioritizing just some sort of real world examples from your actual deployments? Yep. Um, so the, the way that we put data into device pilot is really detailed. We, we monitor a lot of data. We even, um, we, we even pull in the, the current state of configuration data uh, from the devices in the field. Some of that come from, comes from the devices themselves and some of it actually comes from uh, our cloud, uh, cloud databases just to complement the information. And we, one example of how we use this is, is, so we have a scale connected to an Android tablet. Depending on how that is deployed in a customer kitchen, the scale can be connected to the tablet in, in a couple of different ways, three ways actually. It can be connected with a USB cable into the Android tablet, or it can be connected with a Bluetooth connection. If it's a, a tablet that doesn't have a USB port, we have a couple of different footprints. Or it can be deployed uh, with an Ethernet connection, or the, the the vision system that I mentioned earlier, where we use the uh, the AI. It's a slightly different configuration. So there are three cases uh, on on how we deploy the systems. And at any given time, of course, because we're in the real world, things can go wrong. These scales can can disconnect. And uh, we knew that uh, the uh, the scale uptime uh, wasn't as good as we wanted it. Uh, this is this is about. A year ago, 18 months ago, we had a, we had a big push around this to reduce the, uh, the issues and support around scale connections. Obviously, this being incredibly critical. If the scale isn't connected, we can't register the waste going in the bin, and then we're actually losing data. It's like the most serious issue that can happen for us. Um, and so we wanted to improve that average connection uptime. And what we then could do uh, was going in and really check in device pilots uh, which of these different connection types uh, had what type of uptime. So mm. if we segmented on, on the USB connection, the Bluetooth connection and the ethernet connection, it was very easy to prove that the ethernet connection almost never fails. And if it does fail, that usually came with some other thing going, a, a fail in the sense that we could see something disconnecting. We could often correlate that with, for example, a restart of the system. Mm. And then the USB connection occasionally disconnects because USB is, is, is interesting. There can be corrosion on a lead or there can be something in that tablet port that might have been, even though we, we tried to make them as waterproof as possible, we knew that we had some hardware issues sometimes. So we could see that that was 
actually occasionally disconnecting, but what we immediately saw was that Bluetooth was the worst of the bunch. The, the Bluetooth connection was really the area where, where we had problems. So that helped us really focus the investigations on the biggest configuration type that would, by fixing some issues there, very quickly would contribute to an increase of the average uptime. Mm -hmm. And sort of quantifying the problem, I guess. Is, I mean, intuitively, right. perhaps it's not surprising that radio is less reliable, but, but you can actually empirically sort of measure how unreliable and, and yes. how big a problem it is. Yeah. Yes, cool. and, and it also helped us find specific kitchens where we would see this often mm. happening and then dig into the situation there and trying to recreate them or mm. talking to those customers to understand more about what is actually going on there. Is, is, it, is it just the fact that the, 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 the little device that sits between, that, that actually transmits the Bluetooth signal to the Android tablet, is it the fact that it's on the other side of a waterlogged bin? Mm -hmm. Because that would obviously mess with the radio signal or mm -hmm. is something else going on? And we actually found a couple of, uh, what should we call them, engineering related issues that we could mm -hmm. improve in, in, in how the signal would, if it drops, how do we make sure that it reconnects quicker and things like that. So that really helped us focus that, that, uh, that engineering effort on the on the right thing to so to speak. Mm, great. Any other any other examples? Um, yeah. So on a, on another another example on, on the same uh, on the same theme, we have different. Um, we have we have a certain amount of fragmentation of Android tablets in the field. Uh, we have uh, one strain of fourteen inch tablets and a strain of ten inch tablets on a very high level, and they come with. Because we've been we've been a small uh, small operator for quite some time, we've been using off-the-shelf tablets, which means that we haven't really been able to control which version of Android is on them and a couple of details like that. So we have some fragmentation out in the field, and the the way that we've set this up again helps us understand if we have an issue that is recurring somewhere, is it happen is it happening to certain types of tablets or is it happening to certain types of Android operating system or what is actually going on there which again just helps the, the troubleshooting efforts immensely mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and really target our efforts. Great. Good. So um, a fascinating sort of insight into a real, a real world example with all its, uh, all its challenges. So to sum that up, I mean, how would you say that you run your company better thanks to service monitoring? Um, so the, there, there's, 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 there's three high level things. Um, it helps us react faster to any issues that happen, be them be, be, be that one-off issues with specific kitchens or recurring issues. So we can be, we can be really proactive rather than, than reactive in our response. Quite often we know before our customers know if something is wrong uh, with, the, uh, with the device in their kitchen. We have, a really, uh, we have a really good support team who use this information all the time. And we've even built a bunch of automated alerting around it that helps us really be on the ball when, when something mm -hmm. happens. So we certainly, mm -hmm. it, it certainly helps us react faster. Mm -hmm. um, we can continuously track trends. So we can see if some kind of issue suddenly seems to be more prevalent or something is going on. We can, we can segment that in various ways and it helps us, like those examples before, it helps us really isolating unexpected behavior so we can quicker get to the bottom of what is actually going on here. Why is this mm -hmm. occurring? What do we need to do? Mm -hmm. And then I also think it helps us prioritize better because we have that, we can do that quantifiable triage of severity. So it's, it's always the, I mean, the, the, the old, the old uh, saying that the, the customer is always right might not, might not actually be true, but the customer is, is never wrong, right? It is only a matter of trying to understand what is, what is actually going on and what is the best way to help them. Mm -hmm. um, and this really helps us understand if we, if we get loud signals from somewhere saying that something is a big issue, just how big issue is that really? And can we then uh, decide to do an engineering effort or do we need to replace the system or do we need to come up with some kind of workaround to make sure that everything is fine? fine. We, can, we can really do that prioritization much better thanks to, uh, to, to this kind of tool. Mm, yeah, sort of driving off the facts rather than sort of people's emotions or opinions or exactly whatever that. else. Yeah. And, and, and having, and having the, the data available to actually show what is going on. So if, if I'm sitting in a prioritization meeting and somebody says, you really need to look at this or you really need to look at that and we do need to make a decision. Prioritization from a product perspective, in my opinion, is one of the hardest things mm. a product manager always will have to, to do and always will have to do based on some form of fact. Sometimes that fact is 
you really need to do this even though it just affects one customer because it is the customer that pays us the most money, fine, whatever that is. But having the data available to really try to quantify and, and support the decisions you make, I think is really important. And it really helps taking emotion out of a lot of these discussions. Mm, great. Well, thank you so much for, for opening up there, Magnus, and telling us so much about this, this sort of fascinating real world use case. I was just thinking back to how I started at the beginning and I said I thought this would be about 20 minutes long as a webinar. It's turned out to be a bit longer than that, but only because uh, you know, you've been so very generous in going into some of these details. And I think, I think the details are often where the challenges emerge in, in IoT deployments because you know, they are inherently complex. So thank you Absolutely so much. True. So I think that just to sort of really summarize, um, it seems that successful companies use service monitoring to protect their revenue, to save money uh, and to unlock growth. And uh, we're now into the Q&A part of the um, uh, webinar. So if you have any questions, uh, type them now. I see we've got a couple already. Um, uh, the first one is how quickly can you get off the ground in deploying service monitoring? Um, so um, I suppose there's a couple of uh, parts to that. Um, there's, there's actually integrating the data, getting the data flowing into your service monitoring tool. And that's usually pretty quick. I mean, you might be able to do it in literally minutes without writing any code um, if the data is already in a place that the service monitoring tool integrates with, um, like one of the standard sort of IoT um, cloud services. If you have to write code, it's usually very minimal. I mean, it can literally be a line of code in some cases. So, um, so integrating is usually quick, you know, a day or two. Um, there's then a, a configuration of the tool itself to make sure, as, as Magnus talked about, um, that you uh, are deriving the, the metrics and the KPIs and so on that you need to see. Obviously, that's one of those processes that never really finishes, but you can probably get up and running um, within a few days again, uh, to the point where you can actually see what's actually going on, perhaps for the first time, um, and, and then perhaps form a plan about what you're going to do about some of the numbers not being quite, quite what you want. Um, actually, I mean, it occurs to me that uh, perhaps th this whole question about the journey of using service monitoring might be the subject of, a, of, a, of another webinar because it's, it's quite interesting. There's definitely a journey that we see uh, our customers go on from, from day one onwards. Um, Magnus, any, any thoughts on that question? No, I, I, can, I can confirm that. that. That is very much how, how we got started on this. So when we, coming out of a world that we had four years ago, where we, we did monitor our devices in the field, we already had uh, an API, a couple of APIs actually that were feeding our own uh, uh, internal monitoring systems with information. And it was a pretty small task to then just set that data up in such a way that it's instead of sending it to ourselves, we basically started piping it into device pilot. Mm -hmm. That was not a big thing to do. And that at least got us off the ground and, and, and helped us understand how to do that. And then the next step we did was just enter into a couple of iterations of uh, understanding, are we sending the right data? Is there something else we should be sending? Um, but that's of course, that was based on just having access to this information in a way that helped us really understand what is it we really, what is it we really need. So mm -hmm. the, the initial integration was very simple. I think we had, like you said, we actually had it done in, in a day or two. And then we probably over time, we've spent some time on it. We've gone through, I actually think we've gone through three uh, major uh, changes with device pilots where we either have introduced more data or we've added on another product part to send data into device pilot. Mm -hmm. uh, but every time it's been been quite simple to deal with because of the way that that it's all just making sure that we build we build our API on our end and then we interface with your API on your end and it's quite undramatic. Mm. Okay, great. Next question uh, is which particular sectors benefit the most? Um, so I mean, one of the interesting things about Winnow is, is I don't know what vertical you guys are even in. It seems like one of those new things that comes along, which no one had ever thought of, which in retrospect is a brilliantly obvious idea at, at a massive billion dollar market. But uh, I've no idea what, what vertical it's in. And, and actually quite a lot of companies that we engage with sort of fall into that category. They're doing quite innovative things. Um, uh, I mean, broadly, it seems to be 
that uh, it's, it's all around this idea that the device is delivering some value. So if the device isn't really delivering any value, then you probably don't need service monitoring. And I think that, that, that perhaps applies to some consumer offerings which don't have any recurring revenue where the manufacturer is selling the thing as a product. And, and frankly, they don't really care if it works too much after that point. Um, uh, but I mean, that's certainly not true of all consumer products. There are consumer products, obviously, which are being sold as a service, whether you're paying for them directly or indirectly. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, generally it's around the, the recurring uh, revenue aspect. Um, we, we see people using it in a whole load of different sectors. Um, sort of energy is probably a big fat sort of vertical with lots of different parts in it. Um, but there are, there are all sorts of, uh, you know, interesting use cases. Um, okay, I think that's that's all um, for questions. Um, so I would like to thank Magnus again for being so very generous in sharing his experiences with us today. Um, and if you'd like to ask him any more, then he's very kindly agreed uh, to have a one-to-one -one conversation with you offline. Um, just get in touch with me. You can see my email address on the screen uh, and I'll put you in, in touch um, with him. Uh, by the way, you can also sign up to our newsletter uh, if you'd like to get a monthly um, update, a sort of industry um, update uh, from us. Thank you all for attending. Thank you so much, Magnus. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, it's been great to have you here. Thanks everyone for, pay, for watching. Um, the world's a bit of a scary place right now, so I hope you all stay safe. Let's all look out for one another. If there's anything at all we can do to help you, just let us know. Uh, and all the very best. Thank you, Pilgrim. Have a great yeah. afternoon. Bye -bye.